it's more for them than for me. So. Oh, of course. <laughs> ah, college. Um, I love talking to uh, groups of students. Before all that stuff that you described, I was the uh, National Youth Vote Director for the Democratic National Committee at the Watergate when it was broken into. Wow. And we had an exhibit at the Smithsonian for, that's still, some of it's still up there, but it was a permanent exhibit with my name on it in a glass case and everything on how we went after the youth vote. It was a little piece of history to be at the Watergate at that period of time. So I've never forgotten that. But also, having gone to Oberlin College, and then a little later, not too much later, after being at Oberlin, which was one of the most, is one of the most liberal colleges going, and, and, and uh, helped to bust the Vietnam War, and uh, was big on, on legalization of drugs and, uh, and, and those kinds of issues. To then be a national spokesman in drug policy was something I never expected to do or be. And in fact, it was the opposite of how I started out. From Oberlin, I went to UMass, went to grad school, and then uh, worked at the DNC uh, at, the, at the Watergate. Um, but then I uh, went, uh, my first job on the Hill was with Ed Koch, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I was his legislative assistant. He was a very strong liberal, and he had the bill to legalize marijuana. He and Bella Abzug and Ron Dellum, some people you've never heard of, probably including Koch. Anybody here ever heard of Ed Koch? I hope so. Okay, good. Because I, I, I actually just went to his funeral over, you know, a few months ago. Um, sat in the front row uh, section with the former Koch staffers along with Rupert Murdoch, <laughs> actually, <laughs> uh, and some of the other people there. But uh, he actually had the bill to legalize marijuana. And, you know, I, I shifted when I got into drug policy. You sort of learn when you're in the positions of what you do. Because uh, after I um, worked for Ed, uh, then um, I wanted to uh, do some other things and, and got involved with uh, Charlie Rangel. Um, and uh, he was the um, chair then of the House of Narcotics Committee. And I learned. I learned that when um, you expand drug use, hospital emergency rooms jack up. If you make availability easier, take away the moral tool of it being illegal, it just makes it easier. It means that at all the parties people will use, uh, and it means that on the streets it's just easier to get at. And the states uh, that had done some legalization, um, like uh, Oregon and Washington State had uh, done some and then, and then reversed and then now in the last couple of years it's a lot of things have happened. There's some 15 states that have gone into medical marijuana. Two states have gone into overall legalization. But what I learned is that the emergency room cases jack up, car crashes jack up. You look at the countries in Europe and, uh, and there's uh, enormous uh, more uh, deaths from drug abuse. And then when I debate the legalizers on radio and television, I've debated it on Bill Maher, I've debated it on Crossfire, on CNN, all over radio, I've debated Keith Straup, uh, the guy who found it normal, and, and they say, well, yeah, use would, would increase, but, well, there is no but, there is no but. Aside from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how's the play? That's the point. If, if drug use is going to increase because you have legalization, then don't tell me about how crime will go down. It's just... It's a nonsense. It's a non sequitur. You're going to hurt more people, more people will die, and in point of fact, crime will go up too because 67% of arrestees test positive for illegal drugs according to the Department of Justice's surveys of 30 cities. Constantly. It's year after year. I keep waiting for the numbers to change. It doesn't change. 6% of the population as a whole, but 67% but of arrestees. The people who get involved in crime, that's the personality type, and that's... And, and, that's not alcohol. That's drugs. So you're going to illegalize, you know, you're going to make it worse. You're going to, that's the reason why we have prison overcrowding. John Conyers, you mentioned I work for Conyers, he's still a very close friend. He's now the ranking Democrat on the judiciary. He, uh, when the Democrats were in control, he was the chair, and he was the chair of the Government Operations Committee. I was the spokesman for the Government Operations Committee under Conyers. Was having a hearing on um, prison overcrowding, and his staff. Uh, was and Rich remembers this. His staff was going to make it all about how some rich guys, you know, uh, were driving snowmobiles in the wrong place, uh, and uh, and somebody else, a fish producer, was was prosecuted because he didn't pay attention to the regulations and got put in jail for it. Well, he probably should have. He was making. Don't tell me he didn't intend. But that isn't even the point. The point is 
That's not what drives prison overcrowding. That was because the Republican side of, of the Judiciary Committee staff wanted to have a, you know, a hearing on letting rich people out of jail. I said to Conyers, that's not the reason for the hearing. This was right as he was about to go in. Actually, it was the next day that he was going to go in. He forgot that the hearing was the next day. It was that day, but that's beside the point. Um, and so uh, I said, that's not the reason for the hearing. The reason the re for the overcrowding is because there are dr people who are uh, in, in prison because of drug abuse and in prison because of drug dealing. That's what is driving the prison overcrowding. And he said, write that up, give me the talking points, and I'll say it. And he said it in the hearing, and, and you know, there was this African-American professor who said, you're absolutely right, and people backed him up on that. We cha totally changed the hearing. Then I wrote an op-ed in the Chicago Sun-Times with the point that prison overcrowding is because of drug abuse and, uh, and drug uh, dealing. Um, so it is, it is a real driver. Uh, it is a real driver of, of the problems that we have. Now, a sidebar on that one is, I talked with President Clinton about this right as he was about to leave, because of that very point, that prisons are overcrowded because of drug abuse. Why the hell aren't we providing drug treatment in a massive way in our prisons? You'll end most of the crime, you'll stop most of the recidivism, you'll stop these huge hundreds of billions of dollars of costs, and President Clinton said to me, you're absolutely right, and of course then he left, and then that's <laughs> the end of that. So. Um, but uh, that really is a policy uh, matter that, that still, and I've written op-eds on it since then, that's, that's a policy issue that absolutely should be the case. Birmingham, Alabama stopped the need for building a prison because they, on arrestees, developed a program of drug treatment. That's what should be done. And drug courts, they were, when we were in the White House, they were at eight, then uh, Janet Reno and McCaffrey, the then Attorney General McCaffrey, built them to 1,000, then within 10 years they became at 2,000. Now we're 15 years later, and it's, there are 3,000 drug courts where you get treatment instead of prison for, uh, for drug abuse, but it's mandatory treatment, and you've got to be a little hard on it. Um, and uh, just to, to follow on that theme, too, I'm actually throwing splatter on my notes, because it's more fun to just talk. Um, um, Rahm Emanuel, who you now know is the mayor of Chicago and was the chief of staff uh, for Obama, and before that, under Clinton, he was my mentor and, and guru. He was the guy who did drugs and crime uh, policy. I can't say he did drugs and crime, he did drugs and crime <laughs> policy. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, I remember we were going to be doubling drug treatment. Uh, and uh, so I, I went into him and I said, Rom, we're going to be drug, doubling drug treatment. And he did what Rom was famous to do, he got up on his desk and he said, treatment keeps the slime off the street. And I said, Rom, can we change slime to crime? <laughs> okay. And so that's the soundbite that we used was that drug treatment keeps the crime off the street. So it's not being soft to provide drug treatment, it's being tough on crime. And when I talked to Orrin Hatch, who's, who still is a, a, a leader in the Senate, about the national drug policy, I was going to have McCaffrey on, it was either face the name, I was guess it was this week with Stephanopoulos, except it wasn't Stephanopoulos then, it was somebody else. But, um, but uh, we were, we're going to do this week. Uh, and, uh, and it was going to be McCaffrey, the drug czar, who I was working for, and Orrin Hatch, the Senate Republican leader. And Hatch was all set to blast the, the national drug policy because, you know, even back then, it was by a Democratic president, so of course you go in and you punch and you blast. Except that I said to him, you know, we're expanding drug treatment. He said, that costs a lot of money. I said, no, first of all, it keeps the crime off the streets. And the numbers show that it keeps crime off the streets. And being, so being treatment is being tough on crime. And he said, well, I can go along with that. And he actually changed his entire tone in the, uh, in the uh, Face the Name, well, I guess this week uh, interview, and was very supportive of, uh, of what we were doing as, uh, as the two of them discussed national drug policy and talked about points of agreement. So that is an area where uh, you know, even the legalizers say, yes, more treatment, and the people who want to be what you call a war on drugs but we've tried to make a point of saying it's not a war on drugs because you can't have a war on your own people any more than you, you know, a war on cancer isn't, you're not going out and having a war against the people who have cancer. What you're doing is you're providing treatment to the people who have cancer. And the, the deal is you've got to provide treatment to the people who uh, get victimized or victimize themselves. There is a, a self-blame piece. I don't buy the no stigma piece of it, by the way. I think there's... You know, there's a, there is an enormous matter of choice that's involved. So I don't swing that far to the left on that piece of the issue. But uh, at any rate, 
Um, you, that, that's, that's my take on it. So, um, a few other things. <clears throat> the war on drugs has been a failure. Well, actually, no, because drug use has declined almost 50% in the last uh, two decades, from 26 million down to 14 million monthly users. Um, it used to be called casual, but it's actually monthly drug use. If any other social program, whether it's literacy or, or hunger or poverty, improved 50% in two decades, would, would we call it a failure? No. So the, the mythology of, of what's out there, the drugs on, war on drugs has been a failure. All, you can turn on MSNBC and that's all you hear, the war on drugs has been a failure. Lawrence of not, the war on drugs has been a failure. It means they haven't bothered to look at the numbers. That, that's what it means. They haven't bothered to look at the fact that that drug use has radically dropped down. So um, that's, and, and there's a reason that it's working. Parents together with community coalitions, there's 5,000 community anti-drug coalitions, the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, it's CADCA. There's 5,000 of them. In addition to the drug court side, teachers, coaches, pediatricians, media, law enforcement. It's not a partisan issue. I actually, between Clinton, uh, Bush people had me stay for six months. I'm as partisan a Democrat as you get. I mean, I stood and fought Kent, if you ever heard of Kent Starr. I fought him on the courthouse steps, and I fought against Clinton's impeachment, and, and, and it was actually the lead on, radio, on um, uh, Today, Good Morning America, because I was saying that the, the, the witch hunt against uh, Clinton was nothing but, but partisan. Uh, and uh, I said, this is Big Brother at its worst. So I mean, everybody knows that about me. But, the, but on the drug issue, it's not a matter of being Democrat or Republican. It's a matter of saving our children. And, that, and so they kept me for six months to help in the Bush transition, to help uh, build you know, communication strategy. Unfortunately, he, what he really wanted to do was simply do tax breaks for the rich. And so I sort of had to hide under my desk on the rest of his policies. But at least on drug policy, I was supportive of, of keeping it going. Um, Colombian uh, cocaine, we've cut it by half uh, coming from Colombia. Uh, Colombia remains the number one supplier in the world. 90% of uh, U.S. cocaine comes from Colombia, but we've cut it by half. Crack cocaine, which is cocaine, crack, used to be the big driver of crime. That's the main reason that crime is down is because we've, we've killed the crack epidemic. It doesn't exist anymore. It's still there somewhat, of course, but it, it's down. Crack is down by 70%. So um, on legalization, as, as I said, you don't want to take away the normative power and incentive that the law, uh, that making it legal would do. I think it's a really wrong step in national policy that there's a move toward legalization of drugs. I'm liberal on absolutely everything else, but on, on drug policy, I think that's the wrong, the wrong step. Um, I think uh, I agree with the Congressman Conyers and Rangel say it's nihilism and chaos just to not do anything about uh, illegal drugs as a governmental matter. Um, so I mentioned drug courts. This is what I do for talking first and then going through my notes later. But, um, so expanding. Oh, there, there's some other things that are out there that are very good. Uh, expanding methadone and buprenorphine um, to stop addictions to heroin oxycontin. There's sort of a myth out there that, um, that methadone is just substituting one drug for another, except that you can function, you can go to work, you can have a family, you can have a real life. So it's lesser, you know, it's sort of what some people call harm reduction. And some harm reduction is, is a, a big a problem, but that piece of it is, is actually a very smart public policy. Um, and um, you have to do something. Um, one of the things that we have not succeeded at in recent years is prescription drugs. Um, they have quintupled in the last decade. Quint prescription drug abuse has quintupled in the last decade. It's um, Oxycontin has become well, the new heroin, effectively. And now heroin's coming back a little bit, too. So you have to have uh, strategies to, to get at that. And medically-assisted treatment uh, is one of the strategies that is a legitimate one to use. But there's controversy in the field over it because people who don't know anything or aren't scientific and haven't studied it and don't realize the effectiveness that it has think you're just substituting one drug for another. Um, so-called medical marijuana. 
you know, I, I'm big on, and I've done op-eds on this, science, not politics, has to determine what's safe and effective medicine. And I remind people that Laetrile, I don't know if, Rick, you're old enough to remember mm -hmm. Laetrile, mm -hmm. but it was legalized in 20 states, except it turned out to be apricot pits. And it, was, it did absolutely nothing for anybody except stop them from getting real treatment for cancer, and they died. So, I mean, you've got to be very careful about this stuff. I'm not convinced that the effect that you have... Um, uh, from some things on uh, from marijuana is, is any different than having a shot of gin. I think you know the spin and, 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 the, and the feeling is, is, is very similar and uh, it doesn't help your, your eye problems. Uh, people try to say it does that. It, um, you know there are other ways to get hungry besides smoking marijuana. So uh, I, I just I don't buy the medical marijuana. I, what I think is it's a red herring. And what we found is that in California, roughly 99% of the people that go to these so-called clinics are there for not medical reasons. They're there just to pick up marijuana. And they get, and they get uh, uh, any old doctor to write any old thing that makes it so, sort of legal. But it's, it's a fraud. And, and that's, that's a serious problem. It's a serious problem. Free needle exchange is another controversial issue out there. Um, there, the, what the studies are showing is that there's a tripling of drug addicted populations where needles are provided, and therefore probably increases in the AIDS numbers. So it's another sound good kind of a policy that when you study it, and there was a Vancouver study that showed this, that you're actually doing exactly the opposite of what you're trying to do. And so the, the policy of making it easy to use drugs by giving people free needles seems to me, as somebody who's studied it and been on the congressional and the White House side of it, uh, it seems really stupid. Um, terror terrorism is funded by drug trafficking. Uh, that's uh, where the Taliban and Al-Qaeda get a lot of their money. And so uh, I've made the point that one of the stupidest things we've done is in Afghanistan to have a policy where it says in the national drug strategy since since we left, this wouldn't have been the case under General McCaffrey. He goes there and makes the same point I make. But to, to say, we're going to have a uh, laissez-faire, just let them do what they want to do because we would destroy the economy, the economy of the country and then it would fall apart if we did something about the drug trafficking. That is absolutely inane. What we're doing is giving free reign to the money for Al-Qaeda to build to where they're now in a hundred countries. And they've done it by Afghanistan being the number one opium and heroin uh, producer and supplier in the world. We have, and I put this op-ed into the Miami Herald what, about six times. So, so, I mean, by the way, you should go to my website, which is wienerpublic.com, W-E-I-N-E-R-P-U-B-L-I-C.com, and you'll see all the different subjects that I write about, which is a lot more than just drug policy, but that's what this class is about. So, and then go to the drug policy section, and you'll see all these op-eds and all the stuff that I'm sent here in the various op-eds. Um, so I think that's really inane. Um, sports and drugs. That's another issue. Um, I've been very concerned about that. Um, I, I don't think you want to allow kids to have the model that you cheat, but it also has caused parents to have to come to Congress and say that my kid killed themselves because they got, you know, some kind of uh, schizophrenia when they were on steroids. And uh, there's been hearings on that. It's dangerous when a half a million people now, and it, it was a million, we've, we've taken a little bit of a step to, to do it, use steroids um, in sports. Half a million kids use steroids between half a million and a million kids use steroids in sports. When models like Mark McGuire were out there who, uh, used androstenedione, and then it just it, it literally quintupled when, when it was famous that he was using it. And now you've got uh, all these baseball players, which get, they were in the middle of an op-ed, that, that get these token 50-day sentences. I mean, what the heck is that when they're making you know $16 million a year and they lose a third of it, so big dealers are still going to make $10 million for the year? It's, just, it's, it's a pitiful uh, kind of sentence that they give to these people. The Olympics bans you first for two years and then for life on first versus se and second uh, abuse. And that's the way it should be. So I've, I've made the point that, for example, Barry Bonds, who's no longer playing, but he would have been out by the Olympics uh, standards. And all these baseball players, they would be out for two years and then they would feel the pain. They wouldn't get two years of a salary and, and they'd have to really do something. Um, so um, I just think that we have to do more on sports and drugs 
Um, I think it's disgraceful, Rich, and I want to add, by the way, in our op-ed, the, that the Washington Nationals have just picked up and appointed a manager uh, who uh, was in the Mitchell report for having abused drugs and has done it several times. And, uh, and it's like, we don't care, and this is the model we're going to give to our players. So I, I think we have to do more on that, not less. Um, OK, that basically completes the points that I was going to make. But I'm sure we're open for questions now, and right? Mm -hmm. OK, so there we go. Questions, comments, fight me on it. I'm sure you will. Go ahead. Uh, you talked about prison overcrowding due to drug abuse and people who are in prison drugged because they're drug dealing. Yeah. If if, you, if there was if it was legalized, wouldn't there be less people in prison? Because I mean, breaking the law and, and and what what possible crimes could I mean? What about all the college students out there, or anybody for that matter, who smoke weed and you know aren't robbing banks and the only crime they're committing is actually purchasing the marijuana? I don't I don't see how that. I, I don't disagree. And the point that I made was there need to be more drug courts where you get treatment instead of prison. I think that's absolutely right. Um, and I think that's for nonviolent uh, <coughs> drug abusers who, have, who are not dealers. Dealers, throw them in. They're, they're spreading a lot of devastation among our kids and adults. But for single-use nonviolent abusers, absolutely, that's what drug courts should be for. And not only drug courts, but there should be, even if they are put in prison, because in the process of a crime, they were tested and they were positive for drugs. So you've got to divorce that piece of it, too. That uh, a, a lot of this is in the process. They're, they test positive, and then they're, they're committing a crime at the same time. So now you're stuck. You have to put them in prison. Um, and for that, you've got to have drug treatment in prisons. And that's how you get at that one. But we're not doing that. That's a national policy failure, that we don't have substantial drug treatment in prisons. Yeah. Hi. Um, can you please speak to the discrepancy in sentencing between offenses for crack cocaine yeah. and powder cocaine and how that informs the racial, racial tensions in America? I think we just uh, corrected some of that. I think it just went from 100 to 1 to 10 to 1, and there are people that say it should be 1 to 1. I mean, I don't disagree at all that there should be no difference between crack versus powder. It was a racial discrimination that was going on in the law. And a lot of people agree with you on that. And I know Obama has spoken to that. Barry McCaffrey has spoken to that. Um, and um, it's very difficult to get Congress to not be tough on drugs. And so to get them to shift more than from 100 to 1 to 10 to 1, you know, then there are people that are saying compromise further, make it 5 to 1 in terms of the, the disparity. But I, I, I agree. I think it should be 1 to 1. Yeah? I'm going back to what you just said. Uh, what do you think is the reason why no policy has been uh, put in place? Is the only reason the money the program will cost? Or For which? Um, again, like the treatment of, of drugs instead of... Um, treatment in prison. Yeah. Um, because it makes it sound like you're being tough and good to criminals. Uh, it makes it, I mean, it makes it sound like you're being soft and good to criminals instead of hard on them and imprison them. Um, there's been this myth of, of you know, lock them up and throw away the key, and that's what you should do with people who are involved with drugs. It's contradictory and conflicting with, uh, with what would be better drug policy. So it's a lesson. It's a lesson we have to do. I think the statistic is uh, when you add it all up in federal, state, and local prisons, it's about 16% of the people that should be getting treatment are getting treatment in prisons. So it just means that all these other people are going to be out and come back. It's going to be recidivism. It's, it's, it's stupid. And I mentioned the model of Birmingham, Alabama, that stopped the need for building a prison because they provided treatment instead. So it's a huge money saver. And so what I would do with that is go to my op-ed where I lay out this in specifics in the Chicago Sun-Times on my website, and you'll see that op-ed. And also, I did one in Buffalo. <laughs> I remember... Uh, Attica is, is uh, in the media market of the Buffalo News. So I decided, let's go pick Attica since it's a famous prison and, uh, and write about uh, drug policy. So I decided to call the warden. Uh, he put his assistant on the phone, and her only answer was, Attica's not a drug prison. Well, that's not the point. Every prison is a drug prison. Every one of them. 
And so uh, I put that quote from her right in, into the op-ed <laughs> and then pointed out that it's just completely contradictory to the fact that every prison is a drug prison when two-thirds of the arrestees test positive for illegal drugs. So we need to do more when even the wardens at the most famous prison like Attica don't want to acknowledge the problem. Yeah? Uh, how much do you think these treatment programs will work? Because you hear about relapses all the time and then people who don't really want help and just want to get back out and do the drug again. You're absolutely right. Uh, it's got between a third and a half of success rate. And then you have to do it again. You have to do it again. And finally, sometimes, you know, you, well, you do get at it finally after third, fourth, and fifth attempts. But you have to repeat with treatment. And that's one of the sad realities of the field. Okay, back. Um, this is just a clarification on the free exchange needles program. Yeah. Would, is that just needles or are there like medical personnel involved? Because um, yeah. I know back home, I'm from Denmark, and we have this program with really high success rates where they can come get needles, but there are also like medical personnel, social workers. So what do they do with it? What do they do with the needles when they get them? They use drugs. Right. Yeah. That's the point. But so have you have you have you gotten to the expansion of drug use in the programs with the free needles? Right. Yeah. It, but I just think well, that that's the but. I mean, you know, okay, we're keeping them healthy. They're healthy drug users. But I think that's just one of the first steps to helping them get. It's better to have them healthy. Than lying on the streets. I'd rather have them in a treatment program. But what if they don't want That's, to be in a treatment program? Well, I, I, if you get them healthy, they might recognize that it would be better to go to. But it, it hasn't worked that way. What you wind up with is tripling of, of drug abuse in the places where you have the needles. Okay. So I think in the cost benefit analysis, that's not a good program to have. I'd much rather be advertising in those same places where you get the needles free drug treatment. Of course, like if you had all yeah. the money in the world, you would, yeah, you would do that. But I just think like small well, I don't steps. Well, think it's all the money in the world. I think you're saving money from the crime. I actually think it's a money saver to provide drug treatment. Again, I go back to Birmingham, Alabama, was able to stop the need for building a prison because they provided drug treatment to arrestees. I mean, I go back to that. So I think if you provide drug treatment. What, you know, we, we have gun take, you know, paybacks. Uh, you bring your guns and you get money and you give up your gun. They, right, what about drug treatment? So I, that's a much better policy. I, I, that's where I would go on policy. I, I just wouldn't go toward free needles. But, you know, I mean, it does work that way. But yeah, okay, down here. Um, so I understand needing, like, drug treatment for, like, heroin and crack and cocaine, but do you think kids or whoever that smokes weed needs treatment? Well, there's a bit of mythology there. 16% of kids' drug treatment, the most for any drug, is for marijuana, of kids that go into the treatment centers and into hospitals for treatment. Because there actually is, not for everybody, but there is a compulsive uh, use of marijuana factor that, that is involved. Um, and a lot of times, not everybody who uses marijuana gets into some other drug, but you find a lot of co-occurring disorders with, with mixed drugs, many drugs, and marijuana is one of them. So um, I don't know, you can make the point, like Bill Mart said to me, you know, in, in response to your question, he, you know, he said, well, you use sugar first before you do, you know, drugs too, or you use milk first. But I don't know anybody who's been on cocaine that hasn't, started with marijuana. It's not the other way around. You don't necessarily go to cocaine from marijuana, but you do go from cocaine. You have used marijuana first in probably 97 out of 100 cases. And uh, same for heroin. Everybody has started with marijuana and then grows to other things if they grow to other things. So I think you got to catch it early. And the point that Drugs R. McCaffrey says is, if, if you catch it early and, and, and stop people from becoming regular users of marijuana early in, you're probably stopping most drug use in America, and especially if you combine it with helping people not to get constantly constant on alcohol as well, which is used even more than marijuana. Yeah. 
I know there are some states who recently implemented policies uh, to have drug testing in order to receive welfare benefits. Um, is that a program that you would support? No, that's poverty discrimination. Uh, that is outrageous. Uh, and, and that's just a way for Republicans to show how right-wing tough they are. Uh, so I'm very against that. It costs more money in the long run anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talking about what you just said, catching it early, um, what are the demographics of the people that are involved with um, drug abuse? Is, are there like patterns and don't you think well, that's very interesting. prevention programs would be more effective than treatment? Actually, more whites than blacks and more whites than Hispanics use drugs. Uh, there's no discrimination. Rich or poor uh, anesthesiologists are the biggest talk about availability and how it does, <laughs> are, are about the biggest demographic group for abuse of drugs. So uh, there is no demographic, and I don't want to get into how it, it, it's, uh, it, it really is a, is a minority or poor thing, because uh, that uh, is, is a way to uh, just swing the politics wrongly. So the demographics are, are different. They're counterintuitive to what everybody thinks. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the problem of prescription drug abuse actually yeah. going up, one of the numbers that actually well, that's, up. that's quintupling in the last de decade. How do you see um, a policy change there? Because I imagine that any pharmaceutical lobbyists are much stronger than um, the wheat lobbyists I'm in this country. <laughs> um, so what, where do it's you see change there? Because this is available to kids, this is available to people of all ages, it's less stigma, so there's less as soon as people really slip into an addiction, I think it's uh, it's noticed um, often later than, than when actually did they would use cocaine and any sort of hot drug like that. As I was leaving the drug policy office, I started seeing the beginnings of this, and, and this was like 15 years ago. I said that we should, uh, 2001, let's see, 2000, so it was 12 years ago, uh, we should. Uh, make prescription drugs part of the national drug policy. It wasn't in it, but it had to be for the very reasons that you're talking about. And then they did. They put it in the national strategy the next year uh, to make prescription drugs part of the national drug strategy where you have education, prevention, treatment, all of that uh, going in for prescription drugs. Um, the treatment centers of the country's largest, that I actually now still work with uh, CRC Health Group, which is the country's largest uh, treatment provider. They, have, they treat 30,000 people a day in 30 states. And um, they have found, likewise, a quintupling in their centers of prescription drug abuse. So um, it's, it's got to be addressed. Um, and uh, it can't just be illegal drugs, because the prescription drugs do the same thing. Um, the abuse of prescription drugs should be as illegal as necessary. The problem is that prescription drugs also do good things. They're necessary medically for tons of people. Um, and so you, you can't um, stop, throw out the baby with the bathwater on that because treatment is necessary. So it's a balancing act. It's a, it's a difficult balancing act and Yes, the lobbyists are intense. Um, gee, the lobbyists on alcohol are the worst, though, i got to tell you. They're just horrendous. Um, they stopped alcohol from being in the national drug strategy. We were going to put that in also as, a, as, a, as an item that we would do the anti-drug ads for and the media campaign and all of that. And they, they were just vicious. We had some Congress people that were willing to support putting alcohol into the national drug strategy. And, and the alcohol people just wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't hear of it. Uh, and it's, it's really, you know, we're, another object we're doing is money and power in politics. It's just outrageous. The Supreme Court right now is bought and sold by the lobbyists. Uh, the Citizens United case that allows unlimited amounts of money to be used in, uh, you know, in campaigns, uh, in campaign ads, it's just terrible. And it means that you're going to get more and more special interest kind of dominated. That's that's more of a more than a drug policy question. That's that's a political policy question, and it's one which uh, you know Obama has made the point that we're we're completely screwed up on that one. I think the only way that that whole range of issues is going to be solved is when the five four of this court goes back to the five four of a liberal court. 
think it's just the court is the wrong way on that one. So, okay, who hasn't asked yet? Somebody raise your hand who hasn't. Okay, good. Oh, you're talking about suspensions in like baseball, yeah, to like the Olympics. Um, I mean, a 50 game suspension on one season is a lot different than a two year ban when they only compete every four years. Oh, no, you don't. You run track meets all year round. You run in the Milrose games and, and all of that. So that's absolutely untrue. These guys are professionals in, in, in Olympic sports. It's just not true. And I know that because I'm, I'm a Masters runner. I made All-American in the steeplechase, and, and I'm on the National Executive Committee of the USA Track and Field and on their anti-doping committee. So uh, we have track meets all year round. And so to stop somebody from being able to compete and, and stopping them from getting any sanction in a track meet all year round is, is a devastating sentence. And we do it. We did it to Marion Jones and, and so forth. Yep. I uh, really appreciate your honesty in these questions. This a follow-up on the demographic question that you asked for Laura. Um, if, if that's the case with just the statistical demographics of drug use, then why was it that there's a black face to the villainization in the war on drugs? Well, there shouldn't be. But why I mean, was Who's black face, by the way, that there shouldn't be? Who, whose face are you talking about? In Reagan's war on drugs. What oh, well, okay. Because he had a southern strategy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> If, that, if that's your question. Uh, and that's something we've been fighting against, is exactly that. There absolutely shouldn't be. There's less black use than white use of drugs. So you're right. Yeah. And you talked about the treatment policy. What kind of prevention policy? Are, are you the one from Scandinavia, by the way? No, where are you from? Germany. Germany, okay, great. Yes, your your chancellor is very happy with Obama's. <laughs> 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 so what you were saying? See, my question was, what kind of prevention policy would you suggest? Okay, um, we've got to do go back to the advertising. This administration and the last one, unfortunately, are are really weak on doing prevention, treatment, education, and rehabilitation the way that it should be. Um, we had a media campaign that was a billion dollars a year, and as a result of that, in the last three years, there was a 34% drop in youth drug use in America. The last three years of General McCaffrey's being drug czar, where I was his spokesman. We had a national media campaign. It was um, 200... Uh, it was a billion dollar five year campaign, that's what it was. Uh, 200, but it was actually two billion because we did 200 million a year and then it was matched by the TV, so your 400 times five is two billion dollars uh, that we did for a media campaign. And it had enormous impact. It was the message, it was the national message. Um, and the legalizers hated it. They said, you're not having any impact, uh, and you should be doing other programs instead. They didn't want us to succeed. The legalizers did not want us to succeed. So I went on Crossfire, and I brought the ads, and I brought the studies on the ads that showed that after seeing the ads, there was a 16% drop by kids in use of the drugs when they saw the ads. And there was a direct cause and effect. Um, that philosophy has... Uh, changed in the last five, six years. They have zeroed out the media campaign. Zero. Used it for other things because we're so into a slash and burn on, on everything. Now they call it sequestration. Or we're into a slash and burn on everything in the budget. And as a result, youth drug use for the last three years has now started going up again. Not to where it was before, but it's starting to go up again. If you don't have the message out there, people don't know the message. So that's a problem. So there has to be the national advertising. There's a group called the Partnership for Drug-Free America, which does some ads, and they're pretty good at it. Um, and um, so there has to be that. There has to be the community anti-drug coalitions and the support for them, the 5,000 community anti-drug coalitions that are parents, teachers, uh, clergy, businesses, everybody getting together, community. Um, so there has to be that. Um, and like I said, there has to be the drug courts, uh, where you get treatment instead of, um, instead of uh, prison time, that are now with 3,000 drug courts. So there has to be a stronger prevention campaign. 
and that will help. Yep. Um, so it sounds like one of your main concerns with marijuana use is as, um, what's the word, as a gateway drug. Um, and I'm wondering if you'd say the same thing about like alcohol or tobacco Absolutely. use. Absolutely. And so I guess I'm Well, tobacco is a little different. Uh, you know, you get something of a buzz, but it's it's not quite the same as the others. I don't right, but it'll, it could kill you. <laughs> tobacco's problem is that it's a real, real health factor. Right, exactly. And it's a disaster. And my mother died, I'm convinced, early in her 50s because of that. So, yeah. Sure. So I'm, I mean, I'm from Washington State. We did just yeah. legalized last year. And I guess I'm wondering if there are other ways that you think that you could combat um, abuse of the drug, you know, through education or something like yeah. that. Yeah. By, like... I don't know, if you were to increase that, then you wouldn't have so much abuse of the drug, but it could still be legalized the way that alcohol is. Well, I mean, I, there are people who abuse I, I it and use, others who don't. I didn't use one of my most effective sound bites on that. I've used this in the Wall Street Journal, and I've used it in, in the Washington Post, where I've, I've written responses that they've asked for on, on these things. So you have 15 million alcoholics, and you have maybe 5 million hardcore drug addicts. If you want the 5 million to get the 15 million legalized drugs the way that you've done for alcohol. Yep. Just another question. Um, I'm curious about the drug court, your reforms for yep. that. The, the current state of drug court, at least in my state, is that it's not free for the participants who are sent to drug court. So every time they go, they have to pay a pay a fee, correct? Would that be how the reform? I works? think that's based on income. I don't believe that's that's a true statement uh, for people that don't have any money. Okay. Yeah. I, if it's court-imposed mandatory treatment, you're, you're not paying for it. That's like, do you pay for going to prison? No. And yeah, maybe we should make the country, <laughs> but I uh, but they don't. So I don't think that's the case. I, I I will have to check on that, but I am virtually certain that it's not true. That people pay for it's, uh, it's means tested. Well, I, I'd have to check if it is, yeah, okay. but I, yeah, that may well be the case. Yeah, yeah. what would you say is a realistic goal uh, when it comes to drug abuse, and drug user, and reducing that number? That's a good question. In well, fact, that's that's they have to say that in the national drug strategy what the objectives are <laughs> so. Usually there's an objective of reducing drug abuse by 5% per year down from wherever it is. So you do have to have a realistic objective. And, and do you think there's, it's likely that there's ever a time, probably in the far future, where, where we get to a point from zero? No, I don't. I think that's an impossibility. There's, there's always going to be mischief in the world. Yeah. And, especially on college campuses. <laughs> so I don't think we'll ever get to zero. Um, I think we've made some enormous headway. Like I said, we've cut it in half in the last couple decades. Uh, that's, that's a lot that we've cut it in half. Um, when the numbers have gone from 26 to 14 million. So um, I'd, I'd like to you know, get down another 50%. I think that would be where we could go. And I think we could do that. Yeah. Uh, what effect do you think uh, like open celebrity drug abuse has oh, on all. youth, uh, and even having a president who uh, admitted to smoking marijuana in his youth? Well, he admitted to it. He admitted to more than that. He admitted to cocaine. At least he admitted it. Bush, Bush wouldn't admit what he did, and that was in his briefcase 30 years before he was president. He just it. There was a cutoff point of years. He said, I won't talk about before this. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> 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 so, uh, but he also says that, you know, I was young and stupid then, and that's what he says basically about it. Um, to say you've done something that's wrong and stupid is, is also a way to try to persuade people not to do something. So, I, um, but the celebrity thing is more serious, I think, um, because they continually get into that. I mean, you know, Lindsay Lohan and all of that, every, every other week she's... So, um, Paris Hilton, so all of them. I think, uh, I think that uh, it's, a, it's a very serious problem, and I think that 
that's the kind of thing that doesn't discourage kids from going to raves and using ecstasy. When they see that kind of stuff out of celebrities, they think, gee, that's fun and we'll do it too. So how do you think that that can be addressed internationally? Well, by saying what I just said and the impact. Um, you know, people have car crashes and they, and they die from this stuff. And they die from the overdoses. I mean, that's the point. You keep seeing these guys that die from the overdoses. And you talk about prescription drugs, Michael Jackson and, uh, and others. Um, Elvis Presley. Um, so, um, prescription drugs uh, and, and regular uh, hard drugs. Um, people dying is probably the best <laughs> example of why not to use it. Um, and the whole war on drugs uh, that you, you labeled in the beginning, but happened before you guys' time, but maybe, what was it, 25 years ago, when Len Bias from the University of Maryland uh, died. The uh, star basketball player was drafted by the Celtics, and then between playing for Maryland and then playing for the Celtics, died from an OD, I think it was cocaine. So um, that's how the whole national policy really got kicked off and energized. So um, every time there's that kind of celebrity thing, there are, <laughs> there are treatment facilities that, that are for celebrities. And they go there, and the big rule is you can't talk about them because you know, you're breaking HIPAA, which is you know, the privacy and medical laws, and so they're, they're in there. Um, and then the celebrities come out and then say, oh, I won't do it again, and then they do, and that's just another big problem. So, Using publicity and using the message, I think it, it has an impact. Uh, I think, you know, everybody builds information from what they see out there. They build their, their decision-making process from what they see in the news. So the media is a partner. Um, national policy leaders are partners. I think this White House and the one before have been so incredibly silent on, on drug policy. Um, from Washington State, Kurlikowski, the drug czar, who's from Washington State, who was the police chief of Seattle, uh, is, is terrible on, on, on this. He he's, was sort of a legalizer at heart, and didn't want to make it a big deal policy, and, and went to all the other directions on, on drug policy. So uh, he's big on treatment, but he isn't big on, on uh, getting the message out about the evils of drugs and, 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 and um, how it shouldn't be made legal. So um, I think that you know you've national policy leaders play an enormous impact. And as bad as I thought that Bill Bennett was because he wanted to send everybody to use drugs to the, there's cartoons about him, you know, putting people in the electric chair if he smoked a joint, you know, to show the extreme of what wasn't really